the polarization of light intuitively explains the core concepts of quantum mechanics. In this video we will explore these concepts and even encounter the deep reason for Heisenberg's famous uncertainty principle. Let's look at a very simple setup. Take an LCD monitor, which only emits light of one color or frequency. The light emitted from such a monitor is polarized linearly, which we can test by placing a polarization filter in front of our eyes or the detector. If the filter is oriented parallel to the light's polarization, nothing happens and we can still see all the light. But once we start rotating the filter, less and less light is transmitted until we arrive at a rotation of 90 degrees and no light comes through at all. Let us introduce two axes, right and up, and call them 1, 0 and 0, 1. If instead of the filter we rotate the LCD screen, the incoming beam has polarization cosine phi sine phi, where phi measures the angle to the right oriented axes. We call this vector phi. From experiment we then know that the intensity measured by our detector for a beam at angle phi is actually cosine phi squared times the intensity measured at angle zero. Ok, what does all this have to do with quantum mechanics? Well, Einstein received his Nobel Prize for realizing that the light beam is actually quantized, which means that it consists of millions of light quanta called photons. And because we only have light of one frequency, all these photons carry the same energy, E equals h nu. Before we start rotating again, there's a very simple but also crucial observation. The polarization state of a single photon is described by the state vector phi of unit norm. This seemingly simple fact is one of the foundational pillars of quantum mechanics and called the principle of superposition. At any point in time, the physical system, which in our case is the polarization of a photon, is described by a vector phi of unit norm. Since multiplication by minus 1 does not change the physical polarization, we might squeeze up to multiplication of minus 1 into our principle. Now we can play the same game as before. Take a polarization filter and rotate the beam. For two positions it is clear what happens. Rotated to the right, all photons are transmitted. Rotated up, all photons are blocked. But the interesting part is clearly the rotation at angle phi somewhere in between. Because the detected intensity is proportional to the number of transmitted photons per time, some photons must be transmitted, others blocked. On average, however, we must reproduce the classical cosine squared result, no matter if we wait one minute or one day in between sending two photons. But the single photon doesn't care about averages. This means that each individual photon must have a certain probability to pass the filter. In order to calculate these probabilities, we use that the intensity at a detector for a beam at angle phi is the number of transmitted photons at angle phi per time. Then, the intensity at angle zero is the number of all photons per time, because all photons with right-oriented polarization pass the filter. And now, experiments tell us that the two are related by cosine phi squared. But the probability of a photon at angle phi to pass the right-oriented filter O right is of course the number of photons at angle phi passing the filter divided by the total number of photons, which is cosine squared phi. Similarly, the probability for such a photon to be blocked is sine squared phi. Of course, the sum of all probabilities is 100% or 1. Next, let us take a look at the polarization filter. 
In the classical theory, a right-oriented beam is not affected at all, and its state 1, 0 remains the same. An upwards-oriented beam, on the other hand, can never make it through the filter, and its state up 0, 1 is sent to 0, 0. The filter is therefore described by the simple matrix 1, 0, 0, 0. Soon we will see that this matrix already contains all the information of the measurements and will guide us to the next cornerstone of quantum theory. For this, we first define an eigenvector of an arbitrary matrix O to be a non-zero normalized vector n such that O times vector n equals n times vector n for some number n, also called eigenvalue. Okay, so let's take a look at our example. The first eigenvector of O is 1, 0 with eigenvalue 1. The second eigenvector is 0, 1 with eigenvalue 0. We also name these eigenvectors 1 and 0. Going back to our experiment, there's an interesting observation. All our detector measures is if the arriving photon passes the filter or not. If we name these two options 1 and 0, we see that they exactly match the eigenvalues of the matrix O right. At this point, this might seem like a mere coincidence, but if we look at other experiments, we will find exactly the same result. This brings us to the next principles of quantum mechanics. First, the measuring device, in our case the polarization filter plus the detector, is described by a matrix. And secondly, the possible measurements are given by the eigenvalues of this matrix. But there's even more quantum mechanics in the formalism of eigenvectors and eigenvalues. For this, let's look at the probabilities again. Passing the filter is described by eigenvalue n equals 1. Reminding ourselves that the corresponding eigenvector is 1, 0, we see that the probability of cosine squared phi is the square of the inner product of this eigenvector 1 with the state vector phi, which was cosine phi sine phi. In Paul Dirac's notation, this is written as 1 phi squared. The same is true for the probability of our photon in state phi to be blocked by the right-oriented filter. Being blocked means eigenvalue n equals 0, and the corresponding inner product of state 0 with phi squared is 0, 1 times cosine phi sine phi squared. This gives us the next principle, which together with the previous one is called Born's rule. The probability of measuring eigenvalue n for a system in state phi with an operator O is given by the square of the inner product of phi with the corresponding eigenstate n. With the help of a second filter, one finds that after passing the filter, the photons are actually oriented parallel to the filter. But the state describing this orientation is always the normalized eigenvector corresponding to eigenvalue 1, no matter in which direction the filter is oriented. This observation gives us the last principle. After measurement, the system is described by the normalized eigenvector corresponding to the measured eigenvalue. The monitor we have looked at so far only emits linearly polarized light, but light can also be polarized circularly or elliptically. To take such polarizations into account, we actually have to allow for complex polarization vectors. It is a good exercise to go through the whole formalism of polarization, including things like lambda half plates and so on. Doing this, one finds the following changes to the principles. The vector spaces are now complex and the unit vectors are not just defined up to minus one, but up to a complex phase. The probabilities become mod squares and the operators describing measurements must be Hermitian. That condition ensures that all eigenvalues, so all measurable quantities, are actually real. And this is the formalism of quantum mechanics. Any quantum system can be described by a state in a complex vector space, 
The measuring devices are Hermitian operators on this space, and the probability to measure one of the eigenvalues is given by Born's rule. There's one thing we've not yet taken into account, and that's the dynamics of the system. These are determined by the famous equation of Schrödinger, who was one of the founders of quantum mechanics. Or equivalently, the dynamics can also be described by Feynman's path integral approach. Finally, let's exchange two polarization filters. We take the light from our LCD screen to be oriented up again, the first polarization filter at 45 degrees and the second one horizontally. From what we know so far, we can say that certainly some photons go through the first filter, and some of these remaining ones certainly pass the second one. Now let's exchange these two filters. The horizontal filter is now first and already blocks all the light, the second one doesn't even have any effect at all. The ordering of these filters affects the outcome of the experiment. Mathematically, this is because linear operators, the matrices which describe the filters, give different outcomes depending on the order in which we multiply them. This non-commutativity of operators is a general feature of quantum mechanical systems, and it is the root for Heisenberg's famous uncertainty relation you might have heard of.